Thank you very much for inviting me. I uh, am very, very honored to be here in, in Baltimore at the Council and uh, to uh, see such a large audience uh, turn out. Now, unfortunately, I think those people at that end are not going to be able to see much that's on the screen here, so I will, I will describe as best I can so you can figure out what's, what's up here. You won't be able to read the fine print or even the big print, perhaps, but we'll try to make it, uh, make it accessible to you. What, what is that a picture of? Light. Light. It's a picture of the United States at night. And I guess my question would be, who is taking this picture? Satellite or astronauts or somebody. At most, seven people get to see this light in this way. Seven people in, a, in, in the space shuttle, right? In, in, in the space station. And that means that all that light is wasted. I mean, literally, we are wasting half the light we use by having it go up instead of down and out and in directions where we actually need it. And um, when I, my wife and I were building our, our, uh, our, our home, um, which was designed to be a super energy efficient home, one of the things we discovered is you can actually buy outdoor lights that direct lamps that direct all the light down. And you can put in a light bulb that's half as big and get just as much light where you need it. Very simple, very simple. And it was things like that that sort of got me more and more involved in, in, um, in, in the issues that are here. Could you go to the next slide, please? There are really sort of three components to this, uh, uh, to this equation I'm gonna try to lay out for you tonight. Um, first of all, we all know that our, our, our national economy, the global economy is driven by energy. I mean, it just, you can't imagine operating any kind of industry or anything without, without energy. Certainly we would not live as comfortably as we do without energy. And we need ready access to that. And the, I would like to emphasize the energy services that energy provides. In other words, we, we, we don't really, how many in this room really wanted and asked for a lump of coal at Christmas time, right? You know, we don't want energy in that form. What we want are the services that burning coal provides, the light for this projector. Uh, the lights for this room, the uh, air conditioning for this building, uh, the elevator, um, you know, all of these kinds of things, the water, the, the, the pumps that pump the water to our homes, uh, all of these things are, are, are the services we want. Now, there are unfortunately some disturbing trends about the way we're using energy that jeopardize both our, our national security and our economic uh, well-being. And finally, uh, the current pattern of energy use is altering the oceans. It's altering the climate. It's altering the, uh, the entire uh, polar region in dramatic ways, as I will show you. Um, and these also have national security implications. So I want to try to tie these things together. Next slide, please. This is just showing the rise in energy use in the United States from 1980 projected out to 2030. Uh, we use this funny unit in the United States of quads. We, we, were, we were at about 500 quads, a little over 500 quads. Just, that's just a number. It's a lot of energy. Um, by the way, that's, that's the amount of energy the whole, uh, the, uh, uh, the whole world used um, uh, in uh, just about uh, 40 years ago. I mean, we are, it's, everything's gone up. It's, it's quite big, and it keeps trending up. Next, please. One of the most striking things, though, is the change between the so-called OECD countries, that is the industrial countries, the 35 or so industrial Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, North, US and Canada, which used to dominate energy use. And sometime around 2006, the developing world started using more energy than we did. And by the same token, the developing world is now producing more carbon dioxide every year than the developed world does. So these are, these are changes that have taken place. On the other hand, you know, we've had the historic advantage, let's be honest about it, and, uh, and, uh, and, and the bulk of what's in the atmosphere of carbon dioxide and so on, we put there, we, the North, the developed countries put there. But nevertheless, on a year-to-year -year basis now, it's the developing countries of the South that are putting more in. Next. Um, just showing the, the, the red at the bottom there is China and India, the blue in the middle is the U.S., and the green is the rest of the world. And what you can see is, as the bars go up over time, uh, projecting out to, from going from 1990 out, projecting out to 2030, the total, the whole world increase is due to India and China. It's that red thing at the bottom that's boosting up the top. The U.S. is pretty constant. 
so what is the U.S. energy picture? I'm just going to run through some graphics first, and then we'll get into some interesting photographs of things that, that will make it real. So next. This is just showing the top line is our energy use. The next line down is our energy production. We use more than we produce in the United States. The, the next line down is our, our imports, and believe it or not, the little line at the bottom are our exports. We actually export some energy. We export coal. We're actually exporting oil right now. And one of you followed the debate about the XL pipeline from Canada. Virtually none of that oil would be used in the United States. It would flow from Canada down to the, the refinery belt down in Louisiana, where it would then be exported to the rest of the world. So it's an interesting debate with interesting implications. Next, please. This just shows historically going back to the founding of the Republic on the left-hand bar all the way to the present. The low hump there kind of in the middle, that's wood. Interestingly enough, we are using more wood today than we were 20 years ago because we're now using it to try to generate electricity. We're trying to use it for all kinds of things, which may or may not make sense, but uh, we're trying to do something. The bump in the middle that goes up is coal. 19th century, that was the main uh, thing, and then it, it, it le went down a bit and then rose. Um, the t highest one is petroleum, and the other one's natural gas. So we now use more natural gas than coal. Coal is declining, and that's because we are finally closing some of our coal-burning power plants that are older than anyone in this room, <laughs> including me. It's astounding how old and decrepit some of our power plants are. It's time, if we want to be a world industrial leader, we cannot do it with power plants that were built in 1930 and which are failing. Next, please. Um, this is just showing uh, that I industry is the top graph, uh, top line. The next one is transportation. The next one is residential, and the bottom and the lower one is uh, commercial. So um, uh, industry and transportation are almost equal now. We, we, we use as much energy for our transportation as we do for our industry, and that's partly, if you'll notice, our industrial thing is beginning to trend down, and we all know why that's happening. You know, loss of industrial jobs, we hear about it all the time. We are not producing the way we did. But the good news is the, the, the industries that are doing well, like the chemical industry, for example, now produce what they did in, say, the 1970s with about a third of the energy that they used in the 1970s to produce the same amount of chemicals. It's really phenomenal how this has gone. And their absolute numbers are down from what they were in the 1970s, and they're producing tons more of stuff. Next, please. This is U.S. production. The top line is the lower 48. We peaked in 1969 with oil production in the lower 48 and have been going down ever since. There's a little tick up at the end, which is the frenzied drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. And if you hear about it and you think it's just, it's, this is really big and it's really, and it is, it's, it's, it's enormous what they're doing, but it's just a tick on the end here. The other, the lower one is Alaskan production. It comes on abruptly with, the, uh, with Prudhoe Bay and it, it peaks out and has been declining ever since. We're producing maybe only 35% as much from Prudhoe Bay and all of Alaska as we were at the peak. That peaked in 1989. The U.S. as a whole peaked in 1979. So as producers, we were over the top. Next, please. This is just showing OPEC and non-OPEC. OPEC is the dashed line, and uh, we now get more oil from non-OPEC countries than from OPEC countries, but it's still big. And, of course, the big thing from an international relations is in the news right now is will Iran shut off the Straits of Hormuz if the U.S. says we will, you know, we're going to block your selling of oil so you can't use the money to develop nuclear weapons? I mean, this is – notice, energy, national security, they're just intertwined. They are inescapably intertwined. Next, please. This is a little too complicated. I'll just go through it briefly. But the top line is uh, is the is our energy use, or in, in uh, excuse me, petroleum use, and uh, the bottom line is our production. And the difference is what we import. And estimates here are that by 2025 we will be importing as much as we are using today. Now, that was before we opened up the Gulf of Mexico. Maybe that will set it off for a little while. Nobody can predict the future. We can all project the future, and these are all projections. Um, uh, and we are actually using less petroleum now than we were 10 years ago. We have actually 
made some real progress on this. Next, please. Again, just all major sources. This is for electricity production, actually, just for electricity production. Coal's the biggest one, about half. Uh, natural gas is next, nuclear, um, and then hydro, and then um, non-hydro renewables is growing rapidly. Where is the oil? Well, it's not in our backyard. Um, uh, the, the, uh, this, this, is, this, is a, this is a two-year-old figure, and I couldn't find the updated one. And I will tell you, with the um, expansion of the development, as I'll show you in a moment, of the tar sands in Canada, the North American thing, uh, little, little uh, column there gets twice as high. But it's still compared to the rest of the world. We, it's, 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 it's very minimal. Next, please. Uh, this is gas reserves. Where's the gas? <laughs> Not here. It's in Russia, and it's in the Middle East. So we do have an, a, a, an international relations problem here if we're going to keep using natural gas and oil. Coal, we have plenty of, at least for probably the next century or so. Um, but since we're now using less, guess what? We are now increasing our exports, and guess who we're exporting it to? China, of course. Yes, next please. In terms of conventional oil, the sharp spikes are the uh, overall uh, production. And you can see starting in, around, uh, around the, the, the early 2000s, it really drops off and falls away. Production, of course, lags behind those things because it takes 10 or 20 years to develop a field once it's been discovered. The, um, the white ones are the past discoveries, how much was in that field. The uh, light green is future discoveries, that's what we anticipate. And the red dots are the future uh, production as we anticipate it and the darkest what we have. And we can see there's a huge gap between what we are producing and what we are discovering. This is for conventional oil now. So what are we doing about it? So we're shifting to unconventional oil and gas, and we'll talk about what that is in a moment. We're shifting to biofuels. As you know, 10% of all the, uh, when you go to the pump, 10% of what you get is ethanol, not, not gasoline. And um, it only gets about two thirds of the energy per gallon. So basically you've reduced, in a gallon of what you now buy as fuel, it is about, uh, about two or 3% less energy in it than there was before. And when you look at how much energy goes into making ethanol, it's almost a wash. That is, the amount of energy we get out of it is about the same as what we put in. But the good news is the $6 billion a year subsidy to the uh, blenders disappeared on December 31st. There are, there are indeed good things that can happen when the Congress can't get their act together and do things, <laughs> right? There are good things that can happen. So. Um, we're going to increase the fuel economy from 28 and a half miles per gallon to 54 and a half miles per gallon. That's agreed to by the industry. Now, of course, uh, President Obama had them flat on their backs at the time when they agreed to this. They were they needed to, both GM and Chrysler needed to, needed federal money, uh, but they agreed to this. And now they actually seem enthusiastic about it. And at the at the Detroit Auto Show, there's a lot of discussion about the transformation of the U.S. auto industry, the kind of vehicles they're putting out. They've discovered that, that fuel-efficient cars don't have to be, you know, little dink cars. They can be really cool cars. We are hoping for a nuclear renaissance. We, the country, is supposedly officially hoping for a nuclear renaissance. It never seems to quite happen. I'm not sure what's going to happen. There may be two power plants built down in, in Georgia. There may not be any others for a long time. Uh, there are a whole lot of complicated reasons for that. Um, uh, one, they're just ridiculously expensive the cost of building up, and they take forever. And whenever, whenever you have capital at risk for long periods of time, you have reluctant investors. And so the private sector will not invest in it. The only way they're going ahead is with federal loan guarantees. And the biggest loan guarantees, people were upset about Solyndria, but that's peanuts compared to the loan guarantees for nuclear power plants. So, you know, Solyndria shouldn't have happened, but you know, we'll see what happens with the nuclear plants. And then, of course, with Fukushima and the disaster there, everyone is a little more nervous about nuclear power. The Germans have backed out entirely. Um, uh, they are not going to build any more. They are going to go ahead and shut theirs down, require a, a huge political reversal for Angela Merkel, because she was pushing ahead despite the opposition of most of the, of the German public. And then Fukushima happened, and 
in a couple in about a month she turned around and they said okay we're going to go ahead with our previous plan and shut them down and we're encouraging some renewables wind and solar and so forth but it's pretty lukewarm i mean there's not a lot being done and most of it's being done at the state level i mean california is doing phenomenal things um, uh, actually, Massachusetts has, has one of the, uh, the, the, the strongest uh, energy efficiency and, uh, and uh, renewables uh, programs in the country. Um, next, please. Well, here's one of the alternatives. These are the Canadian tar sands. Now, this is what it looks like when you go in there and mine. It's basically asphalt mixed with sand, and the Canadians are burning natural gas to make steam to pump it down into the ground, to melt the asphalt, to bring it out and convert it into petroleum. Natural gas is really clean. This is not. This is really dirty. And it uses, uh, it uses a huge amount. Of the, the, the energy return on investment, as they call it, is pretty low because you have to put so much energy in to get this stuff out. And yet we are now, the U.S., are the biggest importers of this from Canada. And it's the reason that the Canadians announced after the climate negotiating meeting in uh, Durban last uh, November that they were pulling out of the Kyoto Protocol on climate. They just want to keep selling this stuff. This is what the area looks like before it's mined. This is what it looks like after. And this is going to be thousands of square miles dug up like this. Okay. Of course, then we decided offshore oil was going to be the thing. President Obama bravely went where no president had dared go before, at least no Democrat had dared go before, and said, we're going to drill more in the Gulf, we're going to drill here, we're going to drill there, and about, what, three months later, we had the BP oil spill and the fire and the explosion and everything else. Not good, not good political timing, I'd have to say. And this is what it looked like uh, in, in April, shortly after the spill, in lots of places in the Gulf. Um, and. Um, I will say this for BP, they have uh, put their money up and uh, the, uh, the, the commission that was established to uh, compensate fishermen and people who were damaged is going right along. The amount of litigation of people suing BP directly for compensation is really small and shrinking all the time because this, this uh, mediation approach uh, is, is working. The man who's heading it is a, is a magnificent facilitator. He, is, he was the one who adjudicated um, all the 9-11 uh, um, cases at the World Trade uh, Center in New York. And I think there were only something like, uh, I don't know, 25 people who didn't accept the deal and, and went to court, and that will drag on you know, for the rest of their lives and beyond whereas the other people got compensation and everybody cut to what they thought was a fair agreement. So there are ways to do this which actually makes sense. Next, please. Something on the economics. The oil shocks of the 1970s, you we all recall. Price of petroleum quadrupled in one day, uh, and then it went on um, later and doubled, and then when the Iranian Revolution came, it doubled again. And uh, so we went from really cheap gasoline to really expensive gasoline. And, it, and since we were so, I would have to say, casual in the way we used energy in this country, because it was so cheap, we were, we, we, our economy suffered mo mo much more than the Europeans or the Japanese. In fact, this is when the Japanese almost ate our lunch. <laughs> this is when Japanese cars took over. I mean, American cars, even GM now says, you know, we made pretty crummy cars back then, uh, and they were. They just were very poor quality, they, they got terrible. The average fuel economy at the, in 1973 in U.S. made cars, 13 and a half miles per gallon. You know those big boats, the ones that look like aircraft carriers, you know? That. So that led then um, to stagflation, as it was called. You know, there was no economic growth and yet in, huge inflation. Uh, you know, in double-digit inflation. Next, please. Went to 2008, when gasoline hit $4 a gallon, U.S. was sending a half a billion dollars a year out of the country for oil. I'm sorry, half a trillion, you're right, sorry, half a trillion, I meant 500 billion. You know, in today's terms, we talk about billion, you know, we need a 500 billion here and a cut of this there and so forth. I mean, this is that kind of money, and we were just, we're, we're sending it out of the country. So, and, and again, international relations point, a lot of the countries we're sending it to were not exactly friendly to the United States. Did not have, are not, are not simpatico with our interests, and yet we're just, just feeding them money. Next. This is one of my favorite quotations of Condoleezza Rice. 
when she was Secretary of State, she, she appeared before the uh, U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations in 2006 and said this, we do have to do something about the energy problem. I can tell you that nothing has really taken me aback more as Secretary of State than the way that the politics of energy is, I will use the word, warping diplomacy around the world. It has given extraordinary power to some states that are using that power in not very good ways for the international system. I think that's very insightful. I think she's right on. Uh, only thing I don't understand is why was she surprised? <laughs> but, but, but she's right on. I mean, it's, it's I think, a very, very uh, uh, cogent observation. Next, please. So let's, let's uh, just, just a, a note, and, and then I'll come back to national security and energy. But, but if you think about the issues we're facing, the tension and conflict with North Korea is over nuclear. And yet, they started with civilian nuclear power. With Iran, it's the same thing. Oh, we're just, you know, hey, we're just trying to have a little nuclear power plant over here. Well, we don't believe that. We think they're trying to make weapons, just as the Koreans did. The Indians said the same thing. They ended up with nuclear weapons. The Pakistanis said the same thing. They ended up with nuclear weapons. I mean, the, 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 the security issues and various forms of energy are intertwined in many, many, many ways. China and its neighbors in the South China Sea, this could lead to some really nasty things. And the U.S. has been saying, you know, well, we have an interest in the South China Sea. And the Chinese say, no, you don't. And, uh, we're, and the Chinese say, well, we're going to build more aircraft carriers and more submarines in order to protect our interests here. And we're saying, oh, you guys are really getting out of control with your defense budget. And of course, our defense budget is still bigger than the entire world combined, right? Right? We can take on the whole world, at least in monetary terms, whether, whether we can actually do it in practice is another matter. But, but, but in terms of what we spend, it, it is more than the rest of the world combined. And it's, it's a huge problem. The tensions in that part of the world are increasing, and it's over energy resources that might be there. That might be there. We don't even know if they're there. Now. The military is seriously concerned about, about fuels. Um, and we'll get into, so there, you know, there are these petroleum reserves. There are several of them. We have the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, where we pump oil out of the ground and then dump it back into the ground into big caverns in Louisiana and elsewhere so we can get it out quickly if we need it. They're trying to make jet fuel from coal, jet fuel from plants, biomass. They're trying to um, improve the efficiency of all their existing systems. And they're using renewable resources, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Let me, let me bring in the climate change thread, and then I'll try to tie them all together here as we get towards the, towards the end. I got involved in the climate issue back in the 1980s. Um, I um, went to Washington to direct uh, the climate program of an organization, a think tank called the World Resources Institute. And at that time, we would hold meetings on climate change for congressional staff, and we would be sold out. We, 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 there, we, we could only have room for 100, and 200 wanted to come, and so we'd have to do it again. And it was Democrats and Republicans. There was no politics to this at all that I could see. Um, over the years, of course, it's become very politicized. And so what I'd like to do is to try to lay out for you what is the scientific information. I've, I've worked with, on that and with the scientists, and I can share with you what they are finding. And then, there's all, then it seems to me where the political discussion is really justified is in terms of, of what do we do about it. That's, that's to me where the political discussion ought to be. Let me also give you my, my, my thought as to, as to why I think it got politicized as much as it has now. I mean, it was happening all along, but if you look at, at polling data, if you look at polling data, what you'll find is that through 2007, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, a majority all thought climate change was a problem and that humans were causing it. It ranged from 52 to 72%, depending on whether it was Democrats. But, but nevertheless, it was a majority of all three groups. In 2008, suddenly, the Republican support dropped to about 35%. What happened in between? What happened in between was the uh, Norwegian um, Academy of Sciences that awards the uh, Nobel Peace Prize awarded it to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and to Al Gore. My hypothesis is that political act 
was a mistake. I mean, working on the IPCC, it was wonderful to get the accolades and everything. Oh, you, you worked for an organization, got the Nobel Peace Prize. That's great. But I wish we hadn't gotten it. I wish, and, and, and they shouldn't have given it to Al Gore because I think it politically has been tremendously damaging to having good, rational discussions about climate change in this country. That's just my observation. Okay. But these gases are accumulating in the atmosphere. These gases trap heat. And what I'll do is run you through sort of what do we know about this. I won't give you the full climate science 101, but I'll give you the, just the basics of, of what, what I think is some of the most interesting things that are coming out. Next. The main question is, you know, are the changes that we're seeing, can they be attributed to human activity? I mean, it's very much like, again, many of us in this room can remember the tobacco debates. When the Surgeon General in 1964 said cigarettes cause lung cancer, and the tobacco industry said, well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Oh, and we have a scientist here who says it doesn't. And here's some scientific research, which, uh, yes, we did fund. But nevertheless, it says it didn't happen, and so on and so forth. So we've been through these kind of things before. In that case, it took the discovery of not only the epidemiology that people who smoke more have more lung cancer, but finding the particular chemical in smoke, which caused the mutation in your lung cells, which led to cancer. I mean, case closed. There was just no more discussion. Uh, we don't have that kind of, I guess you could call it a smoking gun in climate change, which makes it, <laughs> makes it harder, harder. That, that was not an intended pun at all, sorry. Next, please. There are four independent groups going around the world collecting data on temperature. And there are about 7,000 temperature measuring stations around the world that are certified. And <clears throat> different groups use a different subset of those. Most of them use three or 4,000 of them. And they each have various reasons for excluding some of the others. Or they use things that are, uh, for example, do you include the oceans? Well, it's 70% of the Earth's surface. You might as well include it. Or let's do them together, and then let's do them separately. Because oceans will, will, will warm up more slowly than the rest of the, of the, than the land, because uh, water takes up a lot of heat very easily. But this is the global temperature record, and you can see that it goes, uh, the, the black dots represent the annual average. So you send, a, you know, so uh, today with the internet it's easy, but back in the old days it was paper and pencil records mailed in, and you can imagine how difficult that was, and going back and verifying it hard. But today all of these things are sent in. They are sent in to single places where then people are able to record them, and let's say you get 4,573 stations at your place, and you take those, and you average the high, and, the, and then you average the lows, and you take the, the, the mean between the two, and you call that the global average. And so that's, that's how it's defined. That's, how it's, that's the simplest way to do it. I mean, you don't want to do minute by minute and then average it over 24 hours. I mean, so you just take the high and the low, and you average it. And so... Um, when the data comes in, it looks like a swarm of bees. But when you average it out and look at the statistical variance, you get a graph like this. And indeed, as we all know, some years it's warmer and some years it's colder. And we now know that all those spikes at the top are El Nino years. When, for some reason we don't fully understand yet, there is heat that bubbles out of the Pacific Ocean along the coast of South America. It warms the atmosphere, and we always have forest fires in Indonesia. We have a decreased corn crop in Zimbabwe. I mean, it just affects the whole global system when this happens, right? So in addition to any long-term trends, we have these shorter-term trends, which are not caused by human beings, okay? But notice that the trend is up. It's getting warmer every year. And that trend is continuing upward. The big, the big dip you see in 1990-something is uh, Mount Pinatubo. When Mount Pinatubo erupted, it put dust in the air, which, and it put little, little droplets of sulfuric acid that reflected sunlight back into space. And one of the ways we've actually been able to calibrate things is that being able to predict how fast uh, the temperature would come back to where it was with how, knowing how fast that stuff settled out. And we now know something more that we didn't know about what affects the temperature of the Earth. Okay, next please. 
Um, just basically, you know, the greenhouse effect, as it's called, is is something we've all experienced. If, if th this was this was first idea was first put forth in 1828. This is not new science. It was a French physicist who put forth the idea of the greenhouse effect. That basically, if you had a glass house and you had sunlight coming in, it would warm things up, and then the glass would block radiant heat going out. And you you know we've. Anybody experienced the hot car effect? Right? We've all experienced the hot car effect. That's what it is. The sunlight comes in, it heats up the seats in the dashboard, it gets converted to heat, the heat tries to radiate out, the glass is impervious. It's like carbon dioxide. So, you know, this is pretty basic physics any of us has, have experienced in real life. And uh, this is just showing the relative amounts that's reflected back and so forth. And these, are, these numbers are known very well. It turns out, uh, uh, well, it's, uh, the, the, the amount of sun coming in, 343 watts per square meter. So for every area this big, the sun is putting 343 watts. So think of a 100-watt light bulb as, as, as one-third of that, roughly. And so these gases are, instead of letting the, the heat go back into space, which is what the Earth is trying to radiate, it reflects them back down to Earth. And so it's like having a bunch of little heaters up in the atmosphere adding to the heat from the sun. So next, please. Now the gases, the main gas that's doing this is carbon dioxide, and this just shows it moves in these great cycles, and there's about uh, 750 billion tons in the atmosphere, and we're putting five and a half or six tons a year from our fossil fuels, and, and, and that's adding, and it isn't adding very much, but it goes up every year, as we'll see. And there it is. This is the, this is the record we, this is the, the longest record we have. It goes back to 1958. and. Uh, it's from an observatory out in, in, in Hawaii. If you look at the, at the bottom left, you see there, it, it's an oscillating curve of carbon dioxide and then a line averaging it going through the middle. And what happens is during, uh, during the, uh, the winter, there's more carbon dioxide in the air than in the summer because in the winter, all the trees in the northern hemisphere, many of them lose their leaves and they aren't sucking up carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. Right? And then, of course, in the summer, it's just the opposite. They are sucking up carbon dioxide, and so it goes down. And, we, and so you're, you're looking at the respiration of the planet here, which is an amazing thing. So if you think about the, the, the oscillations as the breathing of the planet, the living part of the biology of the planet, the line is, in effect, a measure of our economic use of fossil fuels. Right? So we have both economy and ecology here in one, one amazing figure. Next, please. Hasn't climate always changed? This is a question that people ask, and the answer is yes. Of course it has, and I'll show you how. It, it, we've been in a relatively stable climate period for about 10,000 years since the last ice age. I mean, everybody, everybody knows when did agriculture get invented? About 10,000 years ago. Why is that? Well, we came out of an ice age. It was pretty hard to plow when it was all, when, we, when, when you know, not down here you were under ice and snow, but in Boston we were under a mile of ice at that time. You know, that's, that's, that was a big ice age. So um, yeah, I think you can say that the one constant of climate is that it changes. And so the question is we're looking for a human signal on top of natural variability. And that's part of the difficulty of doing the science of this. Next, please. This just shows going back a thousand years. Now, there were no thermometers a thousand years ago, but you think of the year 1000 AD, um, Leif Erikson, you know, discovers uh, Greenland or apparently Vinland or something, and, and, and he goes back and tells a, a, the, the first great um, misrepresentation of a real estate agent. He says that Greenland, he called Iceland, Iceland, and Greenland, Greenland, when actually it was the other way around. Uh, I don't know whether he was trying to sell lots in Greenland or what, but anyway. Uh, so that's the left-hand side. And it's possible to get these uh, measures of temperature or estimates of temperature from a whole bunch of indicators. Uh, we, we've got them from, uh, from old coral reefs, we have them from old trees, we have them from sediments in the bottom of ponds, there are all kinds of ways you can reconstruct ancient temperatures. And so each line represents a temperature in a year. And the moving average line is the 40-year running average. Now, to, in climate science, 40-year running average is called climate. 
What happened today in Baltimore, 55 degrees, wind out of the southwest at so many miles per hour, there's many hours of sun, there's so on, that's weather. But I know when I come to Baltimore in January, this is atypical weather because the climate in Baltimore is colder than that at this time of year. That is the 40 year running average of everything. And I know the difference between the climate in Saudi Arabia and the climate in Nome, Alaska, right? Those climates are different no matter what happens year to year, okay? So we can see this going along. We see a big dip there around the time, just, just before Columbus came to the New World, there's a big dip there and, and, and so on. And so the climate varies and, and humans were not changing any of this. All of a sudden something happens around, around uh, 1900. And then something more happens. The red are the, measure, are, the, are, the, are the actual measurements with a thermometer going back to the late 19th century. And the surrogate measures fit it pretty well, which is nice. Something happened around 1900 and the temperature jumped up. It kind of leveled off for a while and then it jumped up again. We now know that the leveling off was due to the fact that we burned our fossil fuels so dirty that they were putting reflecting particles up in the atmosphere and cooling the earth. So we were, the, the heat trapping from the carbon dioxide was being just about offset by the, by the particles that were going up with the soot, well, the, the, you know, the stuff we were putting up. So big change. This, is, this goes back 160,000 years. You know, it hasn't the te temperature and climate, all, it hasn't the climate always changed. And the top one represents uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and the bottom one represents uh, the temperature. You can see that, um, uh, that, the, 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 that we were on a kind of a little plateau of temperature, which is almost what it was about 120,000 years before. And that's interesting because in between is the ice age. So we have these warm periods, and in between we have ice ages. And just before the previous warm period, there was another ice age. And the carbon dioxide tracks it pretty well. And on the right side, it says there's a bar going up, which is current level, which is wrong because it's actually one bar above the edge of the picture now. Because at the time this paper was done, it was there. Let me show you the next one, which is even more startling. This goes back 800,000 years. And the carbon dioxide and the temperatures are in near perfect sync for 800,000 years. We go through nine warm periods and ice ages in between. And the carbon dioxide parallels along with that. But notice, if you can see it, there's a thin green line going up the right-hand side. That's what we've put in. We are so far above, we are 40-some percent above what the carbon dioxide has ever been in the last basically million years. And when I talk to the atmospheric scientists who work on this, they say, you know, it has never worked this way before because the way the planet regulates itself is it wobbles on its axis and about every 120,000 years, it's aligned in a way that it warms up by literally a few tenths of a degree. So how does it get, how does it get 10 degrees warmer and gets us out of an ice age? Well, as it gets a little warmer, carbon dioxide bubbles out of the ocean. Leaves decompose faster. That puts more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so carbon dioxide is the great amplifier of planetary mechanics that changes from ice age to interglacial warming period. And so we see this interaction here, and that's what you're seeing here. Never has the carbon dioxide come come uh, first, the rise in carbon dioxide come first. The, if, if you look very, if you study this really carefully, the temperature starts to warm before the carbon dioxide starts to rise in each one of those peaks, but that's not what we're doing now. So if a scientist says to you, I don't think we understand this fully, that's, that's, a, that's an honest statement. We've never seen this happen in the world before. So we don't know, but we can certainly make some guesses as to what this might mean. We may have put double radiant heat blocking on our windows of our car, and it's going to get even hotter when the sun shines on it. Next. This is uh, believed to be a projection of the, of the of, or a, a relationship between, uh, people say, well, but isn't the sun changing? It is. It's wobbling like that little line at the bottom, and what we're seeing with the heat trapping gases is the line you see at the top. By the way, these warmest times we're seeing right now, the sun is at its thermal minimum. 
So it's not as though the sun is overheating us right now. We are getting these extra warm years even though the sun is at its minimum. It's only a minimum by, by a few tenths of a percent. But we are overwhelming that with the gases in the atmosphere, it appears. Next. What are the impacts? Rising temperatures, obviously, global warming, hot car effect makes sense. When the oceans and things get warmer, more water evaporates, so we get more precipitation. And indeed, we, we have something like 6 or 7% more precipitation now than we did, uh, I don't know, 40, 50 years ago. So this, we're seeing that. But we also see increased droughts. And why is that? Well, we have these intensification of storms where the precipitation all comes down in a big dump and therefore it doesn't get to certain places. So we have droughts as well as floods. The glaciers are indeed melting, as I'll show you. Polar sea ice and permafrost are melting. Sea level is rising because of the melting glaciers. Species are being lost because uh, their uh, habitat doesn't work in the new climate. And there are insects and diseases migrating north. Who would have thought, you know, East Nile virus, right? Nile virus? Nile virus? What does that tell you? It only appeared in New York in 1989. Never been there before. And yet those mosquitoes have probably come in on box loads of bananas and who knows what else for years. But they couldn't survive because it was too cold. Next, please. There are already effects that we're seeing that are compatible with this. And these, the question is, are these really due to the human increase or is this some variable change in the climate? Or are they really different in any way? And the thing about climate that makes it so hard to, to really work on is there's nothing that's going to happen that hasn't already happened. I mean, you know, you have hot days, we're gonna have more hot days. We have, um, we'll have more droughts. They may last longer, they may be more intense. As the ocean warms, tropical storms become more intense. If we see that with increasing frequency, then we can say climate is changing and these things are happening as a result of climate change. How do we know that it's, uh, that, that it's with increasing frequency until we wait a few years? So one of the, one of the, the, the real things that most scientists obey pretty well is, is never to ascribe a single event to global warming. You know, is, um, uh, and I'll show you some things with the Texas drought. Was the Texas drought due to global warming? Texas had droughts before. But is there anything about this, anything about the pattern of droughts? which suggests that it's happening with greater frequency. That's the question you have to ask. But you can't point to a single event and say this happened. Any more than you can say, you know, it was cold that July morning, it must be there's no global warming, <laughs> right? <laughs> we had a warm day in January, it must be global warming. Uh, you, you have to be careful of that sort of thing. I will tell you one thing that's interesting. If you look in, 19, in the 1970s, the number of highs reported in the, across the United States, of high temperatures, the ratio of the number of highs to the number of lows was one because they were about equal. In other words, you had just as many highs as you had lows. 2000 to 2010, there were twice as many highs as lows. In 2011, 2.8 times as many. In the month of August alone, 28 times as many highs as lows in the month of August. Now that's kind of fluky maybe, and it's just a weather event of one year, but the trend is not encouraging. Okay, next. This is a glacier in Argentina. This is uh, in 1929 and, and, and again in 2004, and uh, that glacier that extends to the feet of the photographer in 1929 is completely gone. There's just a puddle of water there. This is not winter and summer. This is taken at the same season, and you can see the three mountain peaks in the back, just the same, but the glacier's gone. Next, please. This is happening worldwide. This is the Pastoritza Glacier in Austria, 1875. You can't even see the glacier in the, in the 2004 picture. It's gone, completely back behind the mountain there. And if you go and look at the uh, Mont Blanc, for example, the biggest mountain in Europe, the, the shrinking of the glacier there is incredible. In the summer of 2003, uh, according to the Swiss Academy of Sciences, the Swiss Alps lost 10% of their glaciers in one summer. It was an unusually warm summer. It was the one that killed about 30,000 people in France from the heat. It was severe. Next. So the glacial melting is raising sea level. Sea level is maybe 10 inches higher than it was in 1900. And uh, that doesn't sound like a lot, 
But what it means is that when you have that neap tide, when you have that next high tide, it has 10 inches on top of what it ever had before. And, it, and then if you get a storm surge at that time, it's just going to be much worse. So we are seeing that already. And we are already seeing uh, eroding. Two thirds of the East Coast beaches are eroding. If it were no change, it would be 50-50. You know, they build up and they, do, they, 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 they wash away and they're built up somewhere else. But two thirds are going down and one third are going up. So this is a huge problem being faced by coastal areas. Um, this is, this is a, a trend uh, line going back to 1970, and uh, we used to use tidal gauges, now we use satellites. It's amazing. The satellites can measure to a quarter of an inch, the average of the whole world, sea level. It's just unbelievable how well it works. And there, the blue is the satellite observations. The, uh, the predictions are all well below that. So next, please. Arctic sea ice melting. Um, uh, normally, it, um, it's that whole area that's colored white and green, and in 2007, it was just the white part. Dramatic decrease. And the next slide just shows a trend line of the melting of Arctic ice. If you do it uh, in, in December, from when we started doing satellite measurements, uh, basically from 79 through 2011, and it goes up and it goes down, but it's really going, the trend line is clear. The predictions are those um, three wiggly lines with the range. The actual is the red. The red, the, the decrease is far greater than any of the scientific predictions. And once again, you can say we don't understand the science if we're underestimating the rate of loss. Storm activity, here we, here's what happens. This is just north of Boston. Uh, about two years ago, we had a, 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 a storm and it was at a high tide and with higher sea level, this seawall didn't quite keep it off the houses. Next. This was, the, you, you can get pictures like this of every, all cities in America now, right? This happens to be Montgomery, Alabama, where, uh, where a, uh, a, a storm in uh, 2009 just flash flood, just boom, never happened before. Next. However, nothing compared to the Pakistan flood of 2010. I mean, just amazing. F uh, 20 million people displaced, covered a fifth of the country, a friend of mine superimposed the flooded area in Pakistan on a map of the U.S. They put the northern part at Chicago. Where do you think the southern part came out? Tampa. I mean, can you imagine if the whole Mississippi Valley had been, been flooded like that? Um, in the Northeast in 2010, we had these torrential rains, uh, broke all kinds of records. We, we, did, we had, we had um, uh, basically 200-year floods in two months. Now, partly we're doing this to ourselves. We are paving over more. That means there's no place for the water to run off. Um, but also, uh, the intensity of the storms is just greater. You, the, the measured rainfall is just greater that comes down in these storms. This is a picture uh, near Manor, Texas, during the summer of 2011. And of course, Texas burned. I mean, the, the amount of burning in Texas last summer was just phenomenal. This is looking down on Bustrup, Texas. That, that's just a charred area. I mean, just square miles of fire. A couple of years before, Los Angeles was, uh, was burning. Now, there have been studies of this. And indeed, the frequency of fires in the United States is increasing. The insurance industry has noted this because they're paying the bills. This is, if you like, is the independent of the scientists, independent of the environmentalists, independent of the Republicans, independent of the Democrats, independent of the Tea Party. These are people who have to make money on insurance. And <clears throat> here, this is this kind of summer, that, that wildlife act, uh, fire activity has increased since suddenly in the mid 1980s, because there's been many more droughts in the West since then. And um, Longer springs and summers that could result as the world warms will continue to lengthen the fire season and continue to cause more large wildfires. So we're already, the wildfire season's already started in the Rocky, parts of the Rocky Mountains. This is as early as it's ever happened. Okay, next. In 2010, Moscow was burning, or at least around Moscow was burning. It was incredible. You can see the temperatures there on the left. Notice the enormous spike. Never had Moscow in history had a temperature above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And they had something like 14 days in which, I don't know, some huge fraction of them were over 100 degrees. It was extraordinary. There's been a lot of discussion about whether or not climate change, global warming, will affect hurricanes. And there are two things it could affect, the intensity and the frequency. 
there is no evidence that there's been an increase in frequency. Even when we had in 2005, 28 named tropical storms, the record and so forth, that was, that, that's a one-off, we have one data point, one year for that. Uh, but the intensity, studies have shown that the intensity of the hurricanes, the power of them, has increased about 50% on average since 1970. And the oceans are warmer. That's where the energy is coming from, where the heat is coming from. And the oceans are, are warmer by one to two degrees. And this is showing Katrina coming in. And um, it gathered strength as it came into the Gulf of Mexico. Then it dropped down a little bit as it hit land. And here's the insurance industry just talking about increasingly destructive weather. This sounds almost biblical, doesn't it? I mean, heat waves, hurricanes, typhoons, tornadoes, floods, wildfires, hailstorms, and drought accounted for 88% of all property losses paid by insurers from 1980 through 2005. Seven of the 10 most extensive, expensive catastrophes for US property and casualty industry happened between 2001 and 2005. And if you see, look at this next slide, and you can see the increases uh, coming um, in um, uh, much more intense in, uh, in the last couple of decades. Next, please. Now, let me just, just uh, move towards closing this up by saying something about, about uh, more explicitly about, um, um, about national security. Every four years, there's something called the Quadrennial Defense Review Report. And the last one came out in 2010, just about this time two years ago. And it devotes a lot of attention to climate change and to energy and its implications for the military. Let's go to the next one. Climate change and energy are two key issues that will play a significant role in shaping the future security environment. Well, they, they produce distinct types of challenges. Climate change, energy security, and economic stability are inextricably linked. The actions that the Department of Defense takes now can prepare us to respond effectively to these challenges in the near term in the future. So, here, just talking about, it says first that climate change will shape the operating roles and missions we undertake. Um, and they're already being observed around the world. Uh, for example, it says uh, they have to adjust for the impacts of climate change. In 2008, the National Intelligence Council judged that more than 30 U.S. military installations were already facing elevated risk from rising sea level. So the military is already, I mean, and they pay attention in a way you and I don't. I mean, they, they're, they're, very, they're out there all the time and wherever they are. Then the indirect effects they think may be severe. Uh, they could have significant geopolitical impacts contributing to poverty, environmental degradation, and the further weakening of fragile governments. Will contribute to food and water scarcity, increase the spread of disease, and may spur or exacerbate mass migrations. I remember in 1989 being at a climate meeting in India and the discussion was, um, well, what's likely to happen? And the subject of environmental refugees came up. And uh, this one fellow was from Bangladesh was recognized in the back, Bangladesh being the lowest lying big country there is. And he says, well, I have a proposal. He said, um, I think that, uh, that, that, uh, that the environmental refugees should be taken in, in by the countries in proportion to their carbon dioxide emissions. <laughs> Every American in the room gasps. <laughs> Because that's back when America was number one. We are no longer number one. China's number one. But back then we were number one. And it was, it was, it was a sobering assessment. Next, please. In this report, they say energy efficiency is a force multiplier. Um, and, and they point out that uh, they can reduce the number of combat forces diverted to protect the energy supply line. In a moment, I'll show you some really disturbing data about that aspect of it. The department is increasing the use of renewable energy supplies and reducing energy demands to improve operational effectiveness. So, in fact, the Department of Energy, uh, the Department of Defense, rather, is the single largest user of energy in the world. They use a little over one percent of the world's energy. One percent. Some diesel fuel costs eight hundred dollars a gallon to be delivered in Afghanistan. By the time you pay everything you have to pay to do it. The Pentagon spends about $20 billion per year on fuel, and a $10 rise in the price of a barrel of oil adds $1.3 billion to the Pentagon budget. Now, in this time of austerity, if you could reduce this by almost anything, I mean, if you, did 10, if you reduced it by $10 billion a year, over 10 years, that's $100 billion. That's a big piece of what they have to reduce by. 
And the other thing that really stunned them was when they did an analysis, over 3,000 deaths in Afghanistan have been associated with fuel convoys. In other words, those pictures you see of the blown up tanker trucks, there are a number of GIs who die in every one of those. And um, the, the, they're just realizing that if they didn't have to convey so much fuel to run the military, they wouldn't have so many casualties. So there are a bunch of things coming together here. The austerity, the climate issue, the logistic problems, the everything that the military is taking another look at all of this. Conclusion, there's, been a, there's a shift in energy supply away from fossil fuels, it's coming. Uh, it will, I mean, we'll still, everyone in this room will still be using fossil fuels uh, for the rest of our lives to some extent, but it'll be less and less over time. There are additional diplomatic benefits of doing so and reducing the potential for conflict because so much of energy is in conflict zones. I mean, it, it, I mean think about it this way. Okay, we don't want to buy oil from Iran. And we'd really not, rather not buy it from that whole Middle East crowd. I mean, it's all, there's nothing but trouble over there, right? Let's just stay out of it. No, this is not Ron Paul standing before you. <laughs> uh, but anyway, you, I mean, you hear these kind of arguments all the time. So where do you, what, what do you want? How, what, what do you want? How about Nigeria? Well, yeah, Nigeria. Well, you know, they're, they're in chaos right now, too. That's not so good. Well, let's rely on our good friends, the Russians. Oh, Vladimir Putin, he's a great guy to make a deal with on oil, right? <laughs> Right. I know, Venezuela. Oh, no, no, Chavez, he's not a friend of ours, is he? Except in Boston, where he donates oil for low-income people. It's a wonderful thing he does. Uh, but but, but the, my point is that, you know, everywhere you go, it's either in a place that is unfriendly to us, hostile to us, it's a place that is difficult, deep, super deep water, or Arctic. We're going to go drill in the Arctic. Oh, is that ever going to be interesting? You think the BP oil spill was something in the Gulf of Mexico, just wait until it's off the coast of Alaska. Um, so we're, we're, we're really running out of easily um, geopolitically available oil. And so we're having to do all these things which are either environmentally devastating, and by the way, every one of those things I showed you increases the amount of carbon dioxide per gallon you actually burn in your gas tank. So these are all linked. Climate change is being observed worldwide. As I say, not any one of those things I showed you could be attributed to climate change, but the frequency of them is increasing. There, there's new research out showing that, that those are increasing. The, the number of times we're getting droughts like the Texas drought and flooding like the Pakistani flooding and so forth is increasing. I mean, you don't even read about the ones that happened in, 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 um, in China, for example, where 30 million people are displaced from flooding. It's just astounding. It's, it's everywhere. Or, or the number of people who die in heat waves in Bangladesh. You hear about it in Paris, but you don't hear about it in Bangladesh, at least we don't in the US very often. So it's happening all over the world. So, so actions to address climate energy and, 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 and climate change and energy are being introduced for reasons of national security, as well as to lower the potential damage to all sectors of our economy and our environment and to us. So thank you all very much.